So um, what I want to do in the next couple of minutes is to provide a formal introduction of Robert, not that he needs an introduction in this audience, but the idea is to use this introduction to set up what will follow the Q&A uh, period. So after I'm finished with these thoughts, I will ask Robert and Mark Lewis, who is the Associate Dean of Diversity and Faculty Development, to join me on the podium. And we will seed some questions to get things going, but the idea is for this to be interactive so that you guys can interrupt us, hopefully not while we're speaking, but we want this to be vibrant because Robert, as many of you know, is a very busy person. And the fact that we've got him here, hopefully without a phone that he can take calls with, <laughs> you know, we can, we can pick his brain, as I said before, and, and, and work with him, all right? So, look, in September 24th issue of the Washington Post, Keith Alexander, the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, wrote an article with a provocative title, Who is this Robert Smith? I was so impressed with the depth and breadth of the piece that I asked my able assistant, who's in the back, Brianna, to post the article on the school's website, not only so that my CBE stakeholders can learn who Robert is, but also can understand something about the foundation that underpins his success and the philosophy that guides his philanthropy. So who is Robert Smith? And why am I proud to add his name to our school's name for the rest of our distinguished future? My take, he's like no one you'll perhaps ever meet. A driven, hard-charging business leader with a unique nose for finding talent in overlooked persons and for building value places others simply lack the preparation to look a child of PhD educators who learned from his parents the value of a good education and the timeless reward of giving back. A high school junior who won't take no, you're not even in college yet, as the end of his pursuit of an internship at Bell Labs. A budding college student who was astute enough to travel east from his native Colorado for Cornell chemical engineering education an alumnus of Olin Hall who understood that learning is a lifelong pursuit, who went on to excel in the MBA program at Columbia University. A young adult who chose to part company with Goldman Sachs to lead his own firm, when many would have settled for his comfortable position as the go-to person in tech M&A at Goldman. I was first introduced to Robert Smith by another outstanding alumnus, Peter Wright, class of 75, just after I started my first term as director in early 2010. Peter spoke in impressive terms about Robert's record as a private equity leader and of the important role our late colleague, Ray Thorpe, had played in Robert's early education as a Cornell engineer. I invited Robert to present the Thorpe Lecture in 2010 in honor of Ray's memory as an educator and mentor, which he did on October 19th that year, almost exactly seven years ago, or six years ago. The message from that lecture was simple, but memorable. You are the captain of your life. Follow your dreams. One of the important things Robert did, I don't know if you can remember this, at the end of that lecture, was to give out copies of the book, The Alchemist, by Paolo Coelho, which I believe is a must read for anyone who's not, who wasn't at that lecture um, in 2010. Robert is a visionary CEO at Vista Equity Partners, a firm believer in the principle that I believe is as Cornelian as touchdown. I will let my work speak for itself. With over 26 billion in assets already under management, an astute focus of company in all aspects of the enterprise software business, and over 30,000 employees worldwide, he has done just that. Vistas captured the imagination of the business community, earning Robert the cover story on Forbes magazine in 2015. With outstanding software companies like Mysis, Active Networks, Bullhorn, and WebSense in his stable, I expect even greater accolades to follow. 
I will leave it to others today to speak about Robert's already impressive list of awards for service to his fellow man, and to Robert to articulate his vision of what he sees as the future of engineering and the future of the Smith School of Chemical Engineering. Suffice it to say, though, that I believe that his gift to Cornell in naming our school is but a down payment on an investment in a system that has proven its value in empowering people to achieve their dreams and to run their own race. Robert, it's my pleasure to invite you to join myself and Mark at a podium. And audience, um, feel free to get involved with questions again, with answers, no heckling. Um, <laughs> and we will do that until 2.30. And there will be uh, two. Oh, oh, yes, yeah, yeah. 145. So, okay, so 145. So, so let's go, all right? Where do you want me? In the center. out of your lives to be here. Uh, the most precious thing we have is time. And we, oh, I thought I turned it on. Put it on the on switch. Green light. Great, thanks. I guess I need Mentos. Um, the most precious thing we have is time and who we spend it with really gives us an indication of our priorities and our, and our values. So thanks for taking time out of your lives to be here to say, share this wonderful occasion uh, with me and my family. Uh, and my family is now a big, broad family, a family of those who I was born with and those who we were made family together. So, and the family here at Cornell. So let's go ahead and get uh, started. Thank you. All right. Okay, good. So as I indicated, we're going to seed the conversation with a few questions. Um, and so the first question that I wanted to, to, to share with Robert. <laughs> Yeah, so, so, so my colleagues know I'm kind of long-winded, but it's, you know, it's for a purpose, all right? At least, uh, <laughs> all right, so, um, you know, so my, my first question has to do with themes that I've already established in introducing Robert. So three years ago, we celebrated the 75th anniversary of chemical engineering at Cornell. Easily the most distinguished elements of that history are the rigor of the education program we offer and our record in educating students who go on to excel in virtually every field. With the decision earlier this year to name the school in your honor, you are now part of us for the rest of our history, our future, all right? Uh, the question is, please reflect upon what it is about your Cornell engineering education that has stood you so well in your career, and also in the context of the arc of your own career and of emerging opportunities and hopefully challenges in the tech sector please discuss what role you would like to see the Robert Frederick Smith School play in educating students who are able to carry on in this tradition of excellence. Great. That's uh, a good place to start. I mean, everyone in this room knows that chemical engineers are the smartest people on the planet. <laughs> All right. And <laughs> All right. <laughs> you guys, you, you EEs can finally admit that in public. Um, the wonderful thing about uh, chemical engineering and my experience here at Cornell and what, what I learned is the way I like to characterize it, every system has its own elegant equilibrium. And what we learned and what I learned here and what we learned as, as classmates and as students and, as, and as, as ultimately practitioners of this craft of chemical engineering is the tools to unravel that equilibrium. And if you actually take that approach to life and business, uh, it helps you start to think about, you know, what's, what is possible and how do you create equilibrium? And it's in physical systems, it's in natural systems, uh, and, you know, how do you actually then drive to an order that creates stability and a platform for, prog for progress? Mm. When I think about what this school is now able to do and, and is capable of, this is the first time in the history of mankind where wealth can be created just from your mind. Hmm. You know, for thousands of years till now, you had to have access to some resources. You had to own some land. In some cases, you had to own some people. 
you had to actually have access to waterways. You had, she had to have access to some capital pile that came as a result of some ownership of some other resource or lending it, lending that capital pile. To pile. Today, intellectual property, you know, the, the, the ideas that you come up with can actually be characterized, A, as unique, and B, you can monetize them and you can distribute them globally instantaneously. And if you understand and can decompose some of these systems, you can actually create massive amounts of wealth, which actually can create a different sort of social equilibrium. And what I'd like to see this school do is to educate, educate the best minds and understanding how these systems work and then drive to a great extent us into many different theaters so that we can drive what I call an equilibrium with the planet. Part of our issue is many of the things that we do I call are, are in chaos or in conflict, in violent conflict with the one place we have to live. But with the great minds and training here, you can think about developing these systems that actually now work in harmony, that make this a sustainable planet, not just in terms of the natural resources, but the human resources. Chemical engineers will get this better than anyone else. And so our we job. We do mass balances. Yes, no. we do. Right? So our job is to educate more of them. Not too many, because we don't want our jobs to be at risk. <laughs> but, but more of them to now go forth into the communities where things are out of balance and bring that sort of an equilibrium to the society in which we live. I don't know if that's all going to happen in my lifetime, but I'm going to do my part to make it happen a little faster and take advantage of this change that's occurring in our, in our frankly, our economy. You know, I'll, I'll finish with a thought about, you know, you all probably are aware of this, but, you know, we are at a very interesting point in, in, in time that every single industry is digitizing. We call it the fourth industrial revolution. And because of that, there is a massive upheaval for the first time of the economic balance, economic resources across the planet and in every single industry. And so to a great extent, it's going to be Cornell students, engineering students, chemical engineering and biomolecular students who, if they understand this, can actually bring new systems, new order, new constructs, new businesses to this upheaval and actually create a different form, and I could say a, a form of life that is much more in harmony and in balance than in conflict. So grand and ideal, but I think we're taking the first steps here uh, the future, on this right? campus to make it happen. Yeah, it's the future. So Mark, would you? <laughs> See, Mom, I knew they'd clap. <laughs> So uh, correct me in the story of I'm wrong. I did a little research on, on you, you and your background. And growing up, your mother would send money in donation to the United Negro College Fund. Mm -hmm. And so I'm right about that. That's good. <laughs> so Twenty-five dollars a month every month for over fifty years. And you're <laughs> so. And both of your parents had, uh, had PhDs, had PhDs, so it's Dr. Smith. So what it tells me is that you, you come from a, a, a group of people who appreciated education mm -hmm. and philanthropy. And these seem to be two big themes that, I, that I, I recognize in my reading about you. So I want to get an understanding of what that means to you and, and what drives that, that dedication sure. and that, that, um, yeah, that, that part of your life. Sure. You know, when you grow up in, uh, in a household of uh, two very well-educated people, um, you know, the expectations are really high about what they want you to accomplish. And uh, as, I, as I told my mother, you know, I finally got two honorary doctorate degrees. Uh, and I said, I think those may have been harder than what she earned uh, <laughs> uh, because it took a whole life in some respects uh, to, to earn those. Um, but I think, you know, part of the community in which I grew up in um, – like a lot of African-American communities, there was an emphasis on education uh, because we absolutely felt that that was the platform uh, on which you could then, you know, launch your family and your community into a, a much better uh, economic position and, 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 and take advantage of the fruits that is, you know, uh, the bounty that is here in America. 
Um, the challenge that, that I always saw uh, growing up was, even though we had very educated people in our community, we didn't actually have access to what I call the economic uh, opportunity that is America. So I'm going to get back to that in a second. But let me focus a little bit on the philanthropic piece, and then you'll, I'll converge them at the end. Um, the way to really think about philanthropy, when I saw my mother writing those checks and when I saw my father uh, at the YMCA leading the, the, the fundraising drives every year, and when I saw you know, their participation in you know, North City Park Civic Association, these civic associations and organizations, and my mother sat on the board of the credit union for the teachers. And why would she do that? Because so young teachers actually had an opportunity to get a loan so they could buy a house and stabilize the community. I mean, those are all these little things mm -hmm. that matter in America that we don't pay a lot of attention to. Um, and so when I think about where we are today, you know, in our economy of, of fast-paced engagement, uh, you know, social media communications, uh, I think we lose sight of the things that actually create the fabric of what makes this society great and what makes America great. Um, when I came here uh, to Cornell, I had the good fortune of running into some uh, young brothers, uh, many of which aren't as young in this room. <laughs> uh, that that uh, I was 12 when I came here. Just so, um, that helped me understand that it wasn't just my community that had those values, and they embodied those values as individuals, as reflected from the communities in which they came from, and they established that here, uh, and in my case, in the form of the fraternity Alpha Phi Alpha, and so. I was drawn to that, and I was drawn to that with, with my roommate, uh, who's here as well, and, and, and the guys in my suite who I used to you know, beat up on playing Risk every weekend, and <laughs> we all still know who the champion is. <laughs> Undefeated. Um, and you know, rematches are always, well, from the stakes a little higher, but you know. Uh, you know that group of, of young men uh, helped solidify why those values were important. Uh, we helped each other in the good times and the bad times and the fun times and the day times and in the night times to stay uh, true to what our communities had taught us was important. And you know, even today, you know, we help each other any time and every time that we can. And that is where it all comes together. You know, if you if you think about the community here at Cornell, the importance of having people who have similar values, um, who understand that you know, service uh, is an important part of being, just frankly, a good human being. And that service comes in many forms. Sometimes it comes in the form of really just helping someone understand that it's going to be OK. And sometimes it's a form of a donation or a gift. And sometimes it's encouraging someone who is down. And sometimes it is celebrating someone who is up. Mm -hmm. But all those forms of encouragement add to those fibers uh, that make communities strong and make them stable and make them, frankly, uh, attractive for others to, to participate in. So it starts, again, in the home, at the ground level. Uh, and as you move throughout life, you're going to find yourself, you know, you come to a place like Cornell, which launches you into almost any community on the planet where you want to participate. So that's for students. I mean, this is an amazing thing. Yep. You can literally leave here and go anywhere in the world and do something fantastic. But part of doing that thing that's fantastic is to make sure that you think about the values that you grew up with and the values that hopefully were solidified here uh, and how you now help propagate those positive values into whatever community in which you then go practice your trade and your craft. Mm -hmm. And a big part of those values for me and my family and my fraternity brothers was service. And so to me, it is just the way you are as opposed to something that you do. You know, we, people talk about, oh, philanthropy is something you're doing. No, that's just who I am. That's just who we are. And it's just a question of how much and when. And the short answer is as often as you can every time, right? Yep. So that's really the concept. <laughs> I see you already touched on this, but there's one other theme I wanted you to um, elaborate on. So this idea of on ramps, right? So you're on record many places yeah. um, talking about the need and, in fact, the urgency of creating on ramps in tech for women, 
persons underrepresented in engineering. And, I, and you know, we all, we all have the aspiration to increase the diversity in engineering, but I don't think I've ever heard anyone said it with the specificity and the urgency that you've put on it. And so yeah. I'd like to hear you develop Sure, it. yeah, you know, the, 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 I talk about it in, the, in terms of the on-ramp into the economy. You know, it, if we were sitting here, here 100 years ago, there would not be the on-ramps into the economy because the vast majority of the resources and, the, and what would be the identifiable ways to create value were owned by someone else. And you didn't have access to that unless your last name was the same as theirs. And you had a few breakouts from time to time, but then when you had you know, various industrial, I'll call it the industrial revolution, it created the opportunity for a bright minds to then create something that no one else created. Okay, you think about you know, the founding of Cornell, right? And you think about the fact that where'd the money come from? From the telegraph. And he developed and invested in the first telegraph and then made a partnership to a company that became what, Met Western Union, held the shares, ran into this guy, A.B. White, said, hey, I got some land, you can do something with that money, why don't you build a school? And so here we sit, right? But it wasn't until there's some sort of a, 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 an event where the economy opens up that only people who are prepared at that point in time to actually launch into that economic opportunity will, will be able to take advantage of it. This fourth industrial revolution, I get a great opportunity to spend time all over the world with some of the largest companies and CEOs. Everyone is trying to figure out how to digitize their business. If you're manufacturing uh, you know, uh, solenoids or, or automobiles, it's how do I digitize it? If you're running a bank, how do I digitize my bank? And so what that leads to is, again, another you know, industrial revolution. In this case, it's an information revolution. We call it the fourth industrial revolution. And so what that does is create a whole bunch of on-ramps to get either A, great jobs on the one hand, but people in this room should be thinking, how do I create great businesses that take advantage of this economic dislocation? The sense of urgency is that equilibrium is going to happen. And when it does, it will likely remain stable again for a generation or two. And so we have to take advantage of there are bright minds in the communities that are still embargoed who don't actually understand or have access to these on-ramps. And so what we talk about is how do we find those bright minds, create enough of those on-ramps so that we can actually help guide them mm -hmm. to this economic opportunity. Look, there is a philosophy that, oh, you can, you know, the wealth should now just get transferred to those who don't have it. That never works. What works is when those communities develop and build their own wealth based on their cultural fabric and dynamic. That is sustainable. And so part of that urgency, for me at least, is to do all that I can while I can to create that opportunity, the identification of those communities, the identification of those people, and think about it con connecting all of the dots so that they have access to opportunity. Mm -hmm. Because that's what it's about, access to opportunity. Now, what you choose to do with it, that's an individual choice, and Will, that's on you. Go read The Alchemist, which is why I give that out, right? <laughs> But it's up to us. You know, we are now stewards of this planet, stewards of this human family, that we have to do our part to help equalize as much as we can and create access for those who don't have. Because as you know, any student of history, and Amigo Wade will tell you about this, if you are not focused on those who don't have, they will someday go get what you do have and destabilize that entire economy and that entire civilization. So those are the things that, that we need to focus on, well and that's why it's important to do it now. Yeah, very nicely said, yeah. yeah. So any questions from the audience? Didn't we plant a few questions that are? Yeah. Uh, oh, we'd be planted many. Right, so okay. any any questions out there? Any burning questions? Hey, your answers My wife have has been a so. What, what is it? No. Your answers have been so comprehensive that I think you're scaring your audience. <laughs> <Yeah. All right. laughs> What's your name, sir? <laughs> <laughs> if you don't remember my name, it's Frank Wilkinson, class of 84. Uh, what's the biggest opportunity and, and or position advantage that you see the Cornell Tech Campus playing in higher education? 
you know, look, you know, Frank, the, the beautiful thing about Cornell is we have, have and still do have a multidisciplinary approach. Um, you know, our tech campus, our engineering school, we work closer together than almost any other engineering school that I've had a chance to visit or see uh, and engage with. You know, everybody understands, you know, the computer scientists, the electrical engineers, the mechanical engineers are, are all building tools so Kim Mees can actually go do the important work, right? <laughs> um, I didn't tell him to say that. <laughs> But, but, but no, in, in all honesty, you know, that's the one thing Cornell does really, really well. We still do have the, the cross-disciplinary approaches in the engineering school. And oh, by the way, you, know, you still have a chance to take courses in arts and letters and literature, etc. that actually helps you understand and develop yourself as a human being. And it took me a while to really understand how unique that is in the context of most universities and certainly most colleges. So. Our role, I think, is to continue to add upon that, make sure that we don't get so you know, focused in our disciplines on the one hand uh, and focused in some respects in just in, in tech on the other that we lose sight of what is one of the greatest beauties of Cornell, which is all the other schools that are here to serve the Kim East. Yes, so that's, <laughs> that's my view on that. Yes, I, so I'm going to ask a, a so I'm going to raise a different kind of question, right? So I've alluded to this point a couple of times, and this is the reputation you have for finding talent in unusual places. And I think one of the key first steps in building on-ramps is you've got to build pipelines, right? right? And so, um, so any thoughts on that? I, you know, I know Cornell, we've worked hard on this, and I know my colleague Susan Daniel, who's shaking her head, is working really hard to do that better at the graduate level. But it's, it's, um, it's, I think um, it's our major challenge. We have the will, yeah. but the question is, you know, how do we find the raw material? But we, we obviously did it with you, and so, the, you know, so <laughs> what is the magic? Yeah. Um, <laughs> look, here's, it, it gets back to, again, these uh, pockets of students exist and people exist, and we often have to find them. Remember, they often exist in their own equilibrium, right? So this gets back to the whole system. You know, one reason I brought my cousin, right, who's here, whose you know, daughter is here in, in, in math, uh, who's going to be an engineer very soon. But, she um, told me. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, you, you look at the work that he does and the work that guys like Louis Tobias do is falling asleep in the back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can see you. Uh, but uh, <laughs> all right, I just want to bet with my wife I got 12 laughs while I was up here. So. <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, those pockets exist, um, and part of what we, what we have to do at Cornell is, and we were talking about this on the phone, is you can't go retail. you got to go wholesale, okay? There are groups of folks who know those students, okay, and know what they're capable of, and they just may not know what we are capable of doing with those students. And so this is all comes to connecting the dots and making sure we're not just saying, well, we'll take those who apply, or those who come from the 15 schools or 25 schools that everybody is recruiting from because, oh, I can go to Palo Alto and sit in the sun or go to Ithaca and not sit in the sun. Well, where are you going to go if you're given equal amounts of money? So it isn't money. Mm -hmm. It's community and it's connectivity, which is important. So part of our job is to make sure, again, that we identify where those communities exist and make sure that they've got very strong linkages beyond the, oh, gee, send your application in. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you about what is here at Cornell that will help you be a successful student and then a successful business person or scientist or engineer or ed educator, whatever it is that you, you want to do. We have to be forward leaning in that mm -hmm. construct. You know, when I was first looking at schools, we had uh, 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 a man by the name of Dr. Ron Simmons, and some of you are shaking your heads and saying, yep, he's the reason that a lot of us are sitting here today. Okay, we all had offers to go different places and money for this and all that sort of stuff, but Ron convinced us that this would be the best place for our development. You have to get back to that, and you have to do it at scale. So it isn't, you know, 40 engineers or 100. It is, it is a wider pipeline where we can continue to get the best and brightest talent on the planet who haven't had access to this sort of a Cornell education and give them the idea and the understanding and the support that they will be wildly successful here, and also we will help them be wildly successful 
once they finish here, either in academia or uh, in business. So let me uh, jump in here. Uh, we, we have a bunch of students in the audience, and one thing I, I noticed about you is that you seem very driven. I think I read a story about when you were in high school and you applied for a Bell Labs uh, program that was for undergraduates, and then uh, they somehow, uh, somebody from MIT stepped out and you stepped in and led, led to uh, a patent or something like this. Is this a true story? Most of that. Most of that. <laughs> So maybe I embellish it a little bit. But the point is that, that you have been driven very much so even since you were a young young man. And so my question is, have you ever had a time where you felt uh, a lack of drive or, uh, or overwhelmed? Because I think some of the students may feel that sometimes. And I'm curious what you would do when that happens. Yeah, those are two different things. Lack of drive, no. Overwhelmed, absolutely. Um, Cornell is hard. Make no mistake about it. I mean, I. <laughs> okay. Not a student. Yeah. <laughs> and then you're going to go back during, you know, your intercessions and, you know, during the holidays and you're going to meet with your friends who are at Princeton. They're telling about how they're just hanging out and at Harvard, nobody's doing work, around talking. I'm like, man, why am I working so hard? <laughs> um, you know, but it's, it is, you know, again, the perfection of craft that, uh, that takes work. You know, and they talk about what's become become an expert, right? You know, I call it 10,000 hours. Um, well, we get that in a month here, right? But um, <laughs> there's just a problem. It's over seven different subjects. But, you know, uh, you know, there were many times in my career and academic uh, career here at Cornell where I was like, this is hard. I don't know if I'm going to get this and understand this. I had the good fortune of having a wonderful group of friends fraternity brothers, and in a community of, of study partners that helped me get through that every single time, okay? And if you don't have that, it's a tough place. So part of what I'm talking about, we have to do is make sure that, yeah, you can create some of that fabric of community, but some of that has to be natural as well um, and organic. And... Those are the things that actually, when you hit those tough spots, you can kind of sit there and moan about it. And somebody says, yeah, I understand. Let's go for a walk. Let's go hang out. And let's go you know, uh, do something we're not supposed to do, like steal a mirror. Um, <laughs> I think we know who stole the mirror with you. <laughs> well, you just saw them admit it, right? <laughs> I was not involved. <laughs> I was having a down moment. <laughs> and they took me out for a walk. I didn't realize what we were doing. <laughs> anyway, statutes of limitations going on. <laughs> and they were on tape, too. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I mean, a big part of, 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 of that is their community. I mean, that's an important part as we build this program, okay, and, and add to what is here is making sure that people understand this community is multidimensional, multifaceted, uh, and supports many people from different places. Uh, that's an important part of who we are. I mean, when I first came here, I mean, this is the first time I grew up in Denver, Colorado, fourth generation. I met people from, you know, Macomb, Mississippi, and a place called Shaker Heights, Ohio. Who the hell is Shaker Heights? What's that? <laughs> right? Uh, you know, met first West Indians. I never heard West Indians. <laughs> right? I mean, so, you know, meeting people from different backgrounds, and you realize you have a whole lot in common. But there's a lot that's different there that helps actually motivate you and me in particular to say, I want to see and explore more of the world because I got to see parts of the world through their eyes uh, mm -hmm. and what it was like when they were growing up and what, what their communities were like and experienced. So, you know, it gets back again to, you know, part of what we have to do and what you all have to do when you encounter those difficult days is do not be afraid to reach out. Most people get here because they were excellent students and... You know, in the high schools I went to, there were like three excellent students. No, um, I mean, you, you're a limited number of excellent students often in the school. Some of you got to go to schools where there are many more excellent students. But you come here, and there's a whole bunch of excellent students. And so part of it is, it is not being afraid to reach out and say, I need a little help here. Or I need some, you know, or just sometimes it's academic help. Sometimes it's just a little support from your friends. And sometimes it's, it's hanging out after finals, <laughs> uh, yeah, drinking a bottle of wine, right? Uh, so, yeah, that's what it's about. So we've, so we've got about five minutes A whole minutes bottle left of wine. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> I still remember that. So we've got time for about two more questions. I got it. 
Glenn Christopher, class of 77. Uh, I really appreciate. Excuse me? I said A5, brother. Oh, yeah. Um, I really appreciate your comments about systems um, and tunnels or linkages to various communities. But on a broader uh, perspective, and I hope you just comment on it. I'm not looking for a definite answer. Oh, and by the way, about those systems, it's clear you took a lot of classes in O-R-I-E. <laughs> <laughs> we just audited those because it wasn't worth the time. To do. <laughs> Sy systems, yeah, right. <laughs> we just audited those. Just, you know, we okay. need a nap. <laughs> Remember, I'm the one guy who can make you over again. <laughs> Recently, I, I discovered that Purdue University is starting a middle school or a, a high school in Indianapolis. Uh, and as I look around uh, our country and in the trenches, in the cities, uh, there's this great disparity of opportunity in education. Um, could you comment just for a moment yeah. on what you see as opportunities, perhaps for this program and this partnership, but perhaps out of this context and a larger picture, as to what needs to be done or should be done to actually tap into the untapped talent to yeah. develop it in our communities. Yeah, Glenn, that's a great question. Yeah. Let, I'm going to take this uh, actually global because this is, this is where this really counts, and you have to think about it. Uh, for, you know, 150-plus years, the university systems in America were the best in the world. Uh, what is now changing and what has happened is, again, the education system has, is also undergoing a digitization and this industrial revolution, which means the following. Only the best universities in the world will survive. Because if I can stay in Des Moines, Iowa, and get a degree at Cornell Engineering or at MIT, why do I need a University of Iowa? That's what's going to happen. Okay, 400 million people, that's going to affect us. But now I want you to think about the 1.3 billion people. You've got to realize 10 years from now, half the world's population is going to be in Asia. And I will guarantee you, they want to be educated like you get educated at Cornell and MIT. Okay, maybe Purdue, I don't know, right? <laughs> no, I say that facetiously a little bit. But in all honesty, that's going to transform the educational systems out there. And so it's going to become democratized on the one end, hand for everyone else on the planet. And so we have to make sure it becomes democratized in the communities here in the U.S. That's the dynamic that's occurring. Make no mistake about it. Okay? And you can go, you know, you can literally go to almost any university and you can start, you know, I have a, a nephew who's at MIT now. He can take classes from home. Okay, full credit, he's there on campus through labs and all that sort of thing. But now you think about 20 years from now, what that now looks like. That gets back to this urgency. We have got to evolve our education system and our models to take advantage of the vast, talented resources that sit in this country called people. And building those pipelines, identifying these people and getting them into our education system onto these on-ramps that is our generation's task to do well, because if we do it wrong, I will guarantee you the economic rent of this planet will flow out of the U.S. into other places where they get it right. And will look like France without the best wine. <laughs> hey, Robert, I just want to piggyback on that question. My name is Lawrence Bancroft. Can you introduce Bancroft. yourself, sir, please? <laughs> no, in the process of doing that. Lawrence yeah. Bancroft. And that was a great question, but in the process of us um, – providing access, what advice would you give to the university, Cornell and others, around cost and cost control? Mm. The rate of costs associated with university education outstrips inflation by three or four times, but it's never an issue that's really addressed. So even if you can provide access, you don't necessarily control for cost. So any thoughts around that would be helpful. Yeah, Lawrence, I mean, it's, it's like, like any system going through a change in equilibrium, it's got to be thought at quite, you know, you know quite deliberately. You know, we, we have got to think about that here and say, do we need another building or do we need to invest that in expanding what is Cornell? Do our walls and our campuses need to be confined to Ithaca and Roosevelt Island or should Cornell really be everywhere? And now the question is, what's the business model that fits that and how do we make sure we're the first and best at that because if you're second and worst, you will not exist 20 years from now. 
guaranteed. Okay, and then you're going to be chasing the cost curve the rest of your life. How do you support this infrastructure, given that you have, you know, one third fewer applicants because people no longer need to come here in order to get educated in this in this fine craft, right? So I think those are the things that the administration have to think about. And, you know, even though we're in the middle of nowhere on the one hand, you cannot close your eyes to the fact that this whole world is now connected. You know, the wonderful engineers out there have now connected this world in a way that information flow is, you know, frequent, fast, and, and without barrier. So those are things I think about. So one, um, so one observation on that point that I'd like to make. So I think this, you know, we, we tend to um, broad brush this question of cost of education. I think if you think about cost of anything, the sort of complement is the value that you get, right? And so I think there are some fields in education, chemical engineering, for example, engineering more generally, where I would argue that you get value for your money coming to a place like Cornell, even at the current cost. And I think part of the dilemma is why does that cost need to be uniform across the university? Right, and I think this point that Robert is making, this big point about digitization of learning, I think that will deal with that. I think this is not something to wring our hands about. I think there's probably already an answer out there being implemented. So are there other questions? Was there one more question? So way in the back. Oh, Ishmael Grady, uh, class of 2018, OR major. Like, <laughs> um, excuse me, to sir, end excuse on me, like, excuse me. What's the I in, in the OR stand for? Or IE? Information. Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, to end on a lighter note, can you kind of speak to what was your best experiences, your best memories here at Cornell? Great, great, great question. Man, I have a whole lot of them. <laughs> Short <laughs> yeah, I mean, Cornell was a lot of fun. I, I, I got into the fraternity life was, was spectacular. Uh, we, just, we just had fun. I can't remember a day when we weren't laughing out loud uh, to a point of pain. Um, <laughs> that was spectacular. I enjoyed, I actually enjoyed, you know, my process engineering class. Uh, you know, to, to me, it's kind of, you take it senior year, it's when it kind of all comes together all the componentry of why are you learning unit operations and, you know, stoichiometry and, ah, this is how this system actually works, okay? And I call the, the grand elegant design of what equilibrium is and how you can upset equilibrium and how it comes back into equilibrium and what that actually means. I mean, there are so many wonderful memories that I have uh, here. Very few of them are weather-related, though. Um, <laughs> But I mean, it is a special place, and, and you can make it a very special place, but a lot has to do with the people you surround yourself with and the experiences that you have. And you can have some very authentic and genuine experiences that in life will, prepare, will, will propel you on when you encounter other difficulties. How did I solve this problem then? You know, and who can I call of my fraternity brothers to whine about something that, that they listen to and, and give you no useful advice, but at least they listen to you, right? <laughs> so, I mean, those are, those are all the, 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 the fabric of what makes this place wonderful. Um, and, you know, going for the first time into, uh, I'll call it the, the, the lives of people who come from different backgrounds and hearing about them and understanding them and, you know, stepping out of a, a comfort zone of community, uh, those things were, were, were very special and helped me understand that we are part of a very big global, you know, I grew up in a wonderful community in, in Denver, Colorado. It was, you know, predominantly African-American. Um, my high school was a, is a desegregated high school and those sort of things. But it was at Cornell where I actually started to, to see people from different, really different socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, and, you know, really different, you know, religious backgrounds and starting to understand, you know, how that actually creates and adds to the texture of, of life and the experience of life. So all I can do is encourage you, your class of 2018, uh, you still have time to switch to Kimmy, e, right? You can, <laughs> anyway, um, uh, I would encourage you to take advantage of truly what is the, you know, the, the broadly defined diversity that exists here and, you know, relish in all of it. You know, <laughs> so I went to my first hockey game here at Cornell. Then I met a, my fraternity brother who played hockey. A black dude played hockey? Where you? <laughs> you know, from Toronto. I was like, what the hell? What? Anyway, um, I mean, those are things. Those, I mean, it, it just, and it opened my eyes to, you know, just be open to experiences and, you know, take them in. And, you know, don't judge them. Take them for what they are. So enjoy your time here.
Because when it's over, man, I tell you, you, you'll miss many days here. Some days you won't miss so much, but I mean, you'll miss a lot of days. Well, so it's a full service learning experience. That's maybe a way to say. So look, so we are, believe it or not, we're out of time. So Robert, any closing thoughts before we adjourn from this component of the program? Yeah, I mean, for, for the students here, I, I, I think I left you with just a little bit of, of thought. You know, people say, you know, do, do you regret anything here? No. Um, do you wish you've done more of certain things? Yeah, you know, I probably, I wish I would have taken more, more classes, uh, I'll say in the arts. You know, I didn't come to appreciate how important the arts are in human development until much later because arts was, you know, you just, you took them because you had to and, uh, but, you know, I started learning the beauty of, 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 of writers uh, and, and of artists and of poets and how that adds to the human experience. Um, and those are things that you'll, 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 you'll kind of come back to. So, you know, go try new things. I mean, you know, our curriculum at Kimmy was, I mean, we're, they took a five-year curriculum, basically crammed it into four <laughs> years uh, and never changed that. So your electives were, were, were limited, which is why we surveyed the OR and IE courses. Just <laughs> um, But uh, I'm not going to let that one go. Uh, but, but you know, take courses in things you never thought about taking them. And I did that in graduate school. And I'll tell you, that was probably some of the most memorable, uh, I'll call it devel developmental experiences I had. So I wish I'd have done more of that as an undergraduate. So if I give you any piece of advice here, I don't really like giving advice, but if I give you a piece of advice, that would be one. <laughs> take some classes that you never thought you'd ever take and just go try it and just Honestly. see. Yeah. yeah. All right, great. So um, thank you, Robert. Thank, thank you. you very oh, much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.